now or sooner. For sure, yeah. That must have been it. It must have been the the wrong account then. All right. Okay, I'm gonna have to Let's try this one more time. Um, you guys, let me know if audio is coming through clear and uh, how things are going. I will just keep on keeping on in the meantime. We'll see. Sorry, this is kind of all just relatively new <laughs> for me and I think for the format seems to be working, maybe. We will see if, <laughs> if you guys can hear me or not. Oh boy, so I started nervous and now I'm just, I'm just gonna continue and, and just sort of a nervous, now it's late. <laughs> Uh, hello, Internet. We're drawing dragons. <laughs> We're drawing the chillest dragons you've ever seen to compensate for keeping you waiting for this long. Yes, good, says, <laughs> says Procreate. Um, seems like it might actually be working this time, which is great. Um, says chat is disabled, which is a shame, but uh, I'm not sure if you guys are out there watching or not. Um, I'm realizing that it's uh, it's currently capturing <laughs> my, my real process, which is zooming in and out a lot. So I'm really sorry in advance if this gives you crazy seasickness at home. Um, hopefully everything is all right and i have a weird feeling that i may have cut out again but let's hope that that's not true and i will trust the good folks appropriate to let me know if things have cut out or if they're going strong So I imagine a good good number of you folks out there, if you're watching this, uh, do indeed follow me on things like Twitter and Instagram. Uh, for those of you who have no idea what's going on, um, I am Nicholas Cole, and uh, Procreate have generously invited me to come draw for you today and kind of just demonstrate what I do uh, using the app. I'm a concept artist and illustrator. Um, recently... Uh, <laughs> I keep wanting to say like a graduate of the Spyro Reignited trilogy, and that's not strictly accurate. Um, I just worked for them, and they are great. Um, and uh, so I did a lot of the dragon concepts for the the new release of the Spyro games, um, which I was a big fan of when I was a kid, and so that was just a dream job. Um, and I draw dragons for a living, essentially. So I just get to sort of do that with you and for you guys today. Um, so I was thinking about what I was going to do and trying to sort of figure out, okay, what would be interesting and what could I talk through as I go and um, realize that, you know, something too conceptually complicated is not, uh, not something I can really talk during as I work through the process. So I figured something I'm more definitely comfortable drawing uh, <laughs> would probably be a winning move in this instance, um, on account of, you know how it is. Most of you guys probably draw yourselves, and I imagine you know what it's like to have people pop in and look over your shoulder and check out what you're drawing, and it can be a little bit nerve-wracking. Um, so, comfort foods, and in this case, a gentle old lady dragon drinking tea, uh, <laughs> seem to be in order, so... 
so we're off and running. Uh, uh, Procreate is awesome. <laughs> and uh, they're not, I, I, I don't need to be paid or sponsored to say that. Um, they absolutely have, have sort of changed my life in the way that I, I draw and do my work. Um, I, uh, I picked this, the iPad up, um, I think over three years ago now, right around the time when the iPad Pro line was just sort of announced and, and, and launched. Um, I think that foot, it's nice, but it's too chunky. I want something a little weirder for her. Something a little older and spindlier, maybe a little more bird-like. Um, and I've been drawing on Procreate for about three years. Um, and when I say on Procreate, like I, I, I do everything on Procreate. So all of the, the Spyro Reignited Trilogy work, everything that I've done, um, for the last three years professionally, um, has all been off the iPad. Uh, and I've been traveling and I've been getting concept art done and it's, uh, it's been a blast. It's been a lot of fun. And, um, initially it was an adjustment for sure. And I, I, I had to sort of adapt my thinking and my process to a new program, which is pretty tough. If, if any of you out there have done that, you know, that, uh, it can be pretty nerve wracking, you know, to sort of move that far out of your comfort zone in sort of ways that, uh, are fundamental. You know, it's not just like drawing something you haven't drawn before, but drawing on it in a program and in a way, maybe making adjustments to the to the very basics um, that make things just a little more complicated than you're used to. And so that was a that was a little bit of a a test for me at the, in the outset, but I adjusted really quickly over time. Realized that. Sometimes when you switch things up and you you adjust to a new platform or way of working, um, it can shake things loose. You know, you just start to think of things differently and look at things differently. And for me, that was definitely the case. Um, so I wound up with kind of some new insights into my own process that I never could have done in uh, in other programs that I'd been using. just because I had gotten so comfortable, you know, I had sort of was taking things for granted. Um, so a couple uh, months ago, I guess at this point, um, I did some sketches of some some older, a variety of, of Lady Dragons. And for the Spyro Project, I got to do a whole bunch of really fun, uh, doodly dragons of various descriptions and ages and body types and stuff. And, and that was a blast, but I, uh, I was sad that we didn't really, in the end, get to um, explore what the sort of female dragon populace would look like. And so I thought this would be a fun opportunity to flesh out some of those headshot sketches that I did a while ago um, for the stream. So my personal favorite has been this blue old lady dragon over here. Um, and maybe you guys can help me name her as we go. But... Uh, I just, she just had a nice kind of very comforting spirit to her that I really appreciated. Um, so I wanted to revisit her as a character for the screen today. Now, not only do I rarely draw in front of an audience, <laughs> uh, I also rarely draw in sort of the silence of my own apartment while I'm talking to myself. So <laughs> there's a lot of new going on here. So pardon me if the process becomes a little bit awkward at times. New for me and for you. So I'm thinking about her design, thinking about different sort of aspects and features that I could work in. I know I wanted to do something in a blue palette for sure. Um, I just really love, sometimes color motivates. Sometimes like the first part of the, the process is like, I don't know what I want to draw, but I know I want to use blue today. Now that does not fly on like professional contracts. Uh, I don't get to make color-based design decisions from the outset. Um, 
but uh, when it's personal work, you know, definitely that, that can come to play. Um, so I'm trying to figure out right now. I want to have her wings spread out. It's not a, like, I, you know, older lady dragon probably, you know, to keep with her character, she would have sort of furled wings, potentially, you know, just kind of give her that, that kind of gesture um, of like, oh, oh, hunched back and oh, I'm, would you like some tea? Um, but I just, it's so much more fun to draw these wings kind of outstretched and spread like this. So I'm going to keep it like that for now and see what we get. So you're just seeing me work through the sketch here, trying to figure out some of the design aspects. Before I started, my wife and I talked a little bit about who she was and what her personality is like and so like what how that might drive some of the design decisions during the stream today so i haven't figured out everything about this dragon in advance definitely some things I have some ideas going in and kind of see how that all unfolds and i know um procreate georgina specifically is keeping an eye on the, the chat i believe if there is a chat going on um so if you guys have any questions, I go. Um, I can't answer all of them, but I can get to a few as I uh, as I work. Um, so let me know, and I will do my best to figure that out as we go along. So sometimes I'll uh, I'll pop into a new uh, layer. So it, maybe it's interesting for you guys if you use Procreate to take a look at my layer structure so far. Um, it's just super dorky technical stuff. Um, but I started out with a really loose sketch down here, just trying to get some of the basics, really gestural. Kind of started to figure out, okay, well, I, you know, like I wanted to work out her arm, you know, the, the crook of her arm and the anatomy of that and the sort of sag of her, her neck and all of that. So uh, putting it on another layer. And then I'll throw a, a layer of, of uh, sort of semi-translucent uh, white or cream over that just to sort of push it all back in opacity. And now I'm drawing on top of that on like a third layer. Um, so it's kind of an onion skinning. As I go on, I get more and more detailed and more and more specific, but I start with that loose gesture. Got a question, which brush am I using? I, I love actually talking about my Procreate brushes because they are made by some rad people who deserve your attention and patronage. Um, the brush I'm currently using is my main brush and this is the uh, oval sketch. I'm gonna write it down. Uh, by, and she goes by Dizzy Tara online. So you can check her out. Uh, she's on, on Twitter um, as well as uh, on Instagram. And she has beautiful work, um, definitely in this sort of similar sort of line driven stylized concept art space that I, I work in. And I saw her brushes and, and immediately knew that I could use it for what I needed. What I love about it is that I get a really like delicate sketch line that's textured. But when I use tilt, I can go straight from that sketch line into like a much looser, softer sort of shade. Um, and I think that's like super, super helpful and useful. I post about my brushes a fair amount. Um, the other one, and you'll see me use it later, I'll bring it up again, is uh, Max Yalikny's Oval Sketch Brush. Uh, I'm just gonna do that. I'm oh, sorry, not Oval Sketch. Wow, that was the Oval Sketch. This is the Shader Pastel. Now, they're probably some of the older versions of these brushes. And I've made some small adjustments for my own hand and comfort, my pressure curve and stuff like that. Um, uh, Max has a, a whole amazing set of brushes online, so definitely go check his stuff out as well. He does beautiful work, and Procreate's actually commissioned him to do some, some cool stuff as well. So go check out Max's stuff. He's he's wonderful. Great dude, too. Um, yeah, I've made some small adjustments. I can talk pressure curves later and stuff like that if people are interested after the, the stream, if you wanna. I'm gonna be answering some questions uh, you know, in a little while after I'm done drawing uh, over on Instagram. Uh, so I'll be on Procreate's Instagram account uh, in a couple hours. And uh, if you guys wanna ask anything super specific or technical or even just general and fun, uh, I'll definitely be doing a more detailed Q&A at that point. Um, so, 
I saw somewhere, I think it was maybe Grizz and Norm who do some really fun sort of tutorial things that can help to draw draw the hand first and then the arm connecting it. You know, before you get lost in how the arm is meant to work. I'm trying to draw how does a dragon with these big old claws grip delicately grip a teacup? Part of what I, I, I wanna get in this character is the sense that she has a delicate personality, but she's still a dragon. Um, so, of course, there we go. I think that, that's gonna do us for a hand holding a teacup and kinda want that to be both a little bit larger and a little bit at an angle. So I'm gonna, since I went on a new layer to test out this hand, I can move it around a bit, depending on where I see the arm. As coming in from, it's a bit crowded in here. It's, uh, sometimes you get this, you know, and especially in the sketch phase, it can be hard to tell what's going on and you can feel like the design's a bit overcrowded, but it's important to pay attention to that as you're going because um, sometimes that's true and you've got an overcrowded design and you need to sort of step back and simplify things a little bit. Hmm. I like it spread out there, but I feel like pushes the teacup out. So, you know, one, one of the features I really love that they added is liquefy, which allows me to push my line art around. So sometimes when I've got a puzzle to solve here, like like her arm, where I'm not sure, I want it to fit right where I need it to, to land so that the teacup's there. Um, I'll use liquefy to kind of move things around subtly, <laughs> especially in the sketch phase, because I'm not worried about it breaking down in terms of it's like, texture quality and stuff like that because i'm going to be drawing over this and painting it up and stuff like that so sketch phase liquify is a, a total lifesaver um another way to make sure that this is uh sort of holding up is to flip the canvas horizontally and kind of take a look at her arms you know i want her shoulder to be kind of up high here her arm comes down here so that's like a higher arm and if the other shoulder is lower. It's okay. It's kind of in the zone. We can fuss with it as it as we go forward if it's not a hundred percent where we need it to be. A lot of people saying hi. Uh, hello. <laughs> nice to nice to see you guys. I don't know. Internet greetings are so awkward. Nice to nice to be digitally telepresent with you today. Um, one of the things I wanted to try with her, and I'm gonna just grab all of the sketch layers and move them together here, shift them to the side, um, is working in uh, a teapot. Because she's a dragon, right? So I'm gonna merge those, because I like where the arm is now. Um, So she definitely heat her own tea <laughs> with her, you know, breath. <laughs> so you get kind of breath smelling tea. Nice, right? Um, I'm trying to think where that's gonna that'll be best. I'm thinking that the teapot is Um, sorry, sometimes I just get lost in thinking about the thing and it's difficult to talk about the thing when you're thinking about the thing. Um, so instead of having her tail hit low where I had initially sketched it, thinking about bringing her tail up 
high so that it's grasping the teapot to where her breath can reach it. And then again, liquify I use in the sketch phase to kind of help me sort of figure out the relative, like the curve of her tail right now. So when you bring in liquify on, it's just been a total, <laughs> a total lifesaver. Um, Cause it just, it just helps you speed it up. I can redraw it. That's not an issue. You know, I, I don't think it's lazy to, to use a feature that helps you kind of move through things quicker. And I don't have any, I don't need to prove that I can redraw the tail if I need to. I just need to get to a point where the tail is where I, I want it. So if liquify helps you move stuff around, use it, you know, absolutely. Let's uh, take both of those. And what's cool is I can, this is so cool. Sorry, I'm, I'm just bragging on Procreate right now, but um, I can transform multiple layers with liquify at once. So the teapot's on its own layer right now and the tail, but I can select just the part of the tail and not the rest of her body. She's like, you can smell it. Ah, tea. Ah, oh, tea. So, uh, I've got a question. Um, how much thought do I put into a character's story and world when designing them from scratch. This is so funny because this is literally, I had this panicked conversation with my wife right before the stream about like, how specific should this be? Like, I don't know, I'm so used to having all this context and, and this is just gonna be a character with no no context. Um, and uh, so this, this in particular is a little bit tricky. Um, because I'm trying to figure out how best to uh, design a character that's not for anything in particular. It's just for fun. It's for me. It's for you. Um, all right, let's deselect. There we go. Sorry, I had it selected. Sometimes I forget what I've done. Um, getting the right level of specificity is so hard sometimes to be honest with you guys it um can be a really tricky thing because with something that's like fan art you you've got to provide so much context for somebody to understand what it is and 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 why they should be interested in it you know uh it can be a beautiful drawing and that's that's fun and that's great and i like to do that for sure too and there's no no question that we all like to just look at things that look nice um and, uh, and yeah, I, I always find I'm really drawn to uh, work and, and, and doing work, if I can, that has more of an idea, uh, a world, some context. Um, but like the question asker asked, it, 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 there's, there's, it's just from scratch, you know? There's not, I don't have a world, there's no team of, of designers sort of helping me provide context for this character so i started with her was just with a feeling you know i really wanted to uh get this kind of grandmotherly kind of warm pleasant uh vibe and then as i talked through it and sort of thought through it i was like okay well there's this dragon right it, it, she's a dragon so it's she's not going to be as like cuddly uh as your own grandma really you know she can be and she probably will have it in her in her spirit to be but you just realize like, okay, I know I want to draw a dragon. I know I want it to have this kind of vibe and spirit. Um, and then the other ideas start to flow as you decide, um, you know, as you build, it's kind of like, you know, just adding brick on brick um, to figure out like, okay, so what else is true about this character? What's, what's, what are the facts here? Uh, does she knit, you know, does she, she loves tea. Does she crochet? Is she a cross stitcher? Does she play, you know, uh, canasta? Does she, you know, like wh whatever, you know, like, and then you realize like, okay, maybe the, I'm getting too, too much into stereotype and not enough into specifics. And, and when that happens, I like to think about like, okay, what do I, what do I remember about my own grandparents or a specific, you know, older woman who uh, this reminds me of and how can I, <laughs> create a character here that um, 
is going to evoke those people that I love, you know, so what, what about them is, is fun and specific and where there's originals came up. I don't think there's going to be too much of an opportunity to add where there's originals to this design, but <laughs> I realized like Erica and I both have grandparents uh, who just like always had like individually wrapped hard candy on them <laughs> at all times or those tins. You guys remember those, I don't know if you know, old European grandparents for sure had like tins of dusty hard candy. Um, and, uh, and they all kind of tasted sort of vaguely the same and had that kind of like sugary dust on them. That I just have a very fond memory of sifting through. I grew up, uh, kind of, I'm an American that was raised overseas in Europe. Um, and so a lot of my early life has sort of some, I, I only bring that up because I'm thinking about the flavor cassis, which cassis is not, I don't even think they have it in, in American stores, but uh, I think it's called black currant here. Um, but cassis is just everywhere there. It's kind of like ha the hazelnut of fruit flavor and candies. Ah, candies were all hazelnut or cassis in like Austria and Holland when I was a kid. And my my little teenage American bits, were, uh, you know, the little parts of my heart that just wanted an Oreo did not care for the omnipresence of, <laughs> of Cassis. But now I'm older, I'm like, oh man, I missed that. So sometimes a little, <laughs> I'm off on a little tangent there, but sometimes doing designs like this are just, just set you right back. Put you on a path down memory lane. I think she'll have those like little, she doesn't have ears, so she can't, I'm not giving her like stems to her glasses. Um, but I think that she can have those little like kind of ropey chains link back. Um, and then some fire it was the idea that was happening. It's like I don't know. I don't know about fire. She's not. She doesn't really have that expression. I'm not sure. I want to invest too much time in adjusting her expression. So I kind of like where her face is at right now. So maybe we'll just imply the fire instead of doing it outright. My audio may cut out for a bit here. My, of course, my uh, headphones are acting up. Why wouldn't they? You may have to endure the noise of my pen tapping for a bit while those recharge. So now let me see, it's making a something stir sticky. Pull the tea. When did I start using warm pastel tones as the background for all my characters? Feels like a signature uh, of mine and you find it super appealing. Oh, that's very nice. The You're talking about the sort of the, the pale cream color that I'm using instead of uh, sort of chalk white. Um, I think honestly that started around the beginning of my sort of Jellybots project. Um, I was, I, I don't, not really sure that I can trace the exact origin, um, but it had to do with trying to evoke a very particular feeling, this kind of, um, I don't know, there was something, I always talk, uh, people who, who are part of the Jellybots Patreon, and I know there are a few of them tuned in right now, I, I have a project called Jellybots, which if you look up my, my work online, you'll see um, there's a bunch of that uh, out about. Um, and uh, a big part of that project is part of this aesthetic, kind of that like sort of cream colored background, pastel tones and stuff like that. And I, I think it just came out of the origins of that project for me 
which had to do with, um, it's so funny as I'm actually trying to like name it, I'm realizing that like, you know, like, let's be honest. I really was thinking about like the aesthetic of a frozen yogurt (laughs) store that I had been in once, uh, kind of the colors that I associated with this kind of, uh, pleasant sort of Euro Japanese kind of, uh, chic space that was really colorful and playful and fun um and i talked to the guys on uh people from the the jelly butts forums a lot about um wanting to make art that uh like we when we we design you know sometimes you're using these really bold colors and flavors and you're pushing stuff really far into the dark or or making things really edgy um and uh but often, you know, you're obliged as a character designer to create designs that are um, kind of vanilla, you know, kind of in the vanilla space, kind of in this, like, you know, okay, um, you know, how do I uh, how do I describe that? Like, you have to you have to create a, a, a generic protagonist, and and you want them to be um, just a little bit more interesting, a little bit more memorable, but not so loud. Uh, design wise that you know you you they they look too too interesting if that makes any sense um because that, that's sometimes the case you don't want a character every character can't be maximum special <laughs> um and so you have to kind of pick your battles and anyways all that to say i have this this little thing i i, I usually say to myself as I'm, I'm doing that that i don't want to create uh vanilla i i, I want to create french vanilla like sort of off-white vanilla with flecks in it the sort of vanilla bean flecks and bits um and uh for whatever reason that's like an easy way for me to understand or sort of communicate the idea i think that's part of what drives me to the sort of color palette is the idea of like i want the appeal to 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 be broad sometimes you know uh not always but you know often trying to you know tread that line and create stuff that has a a broad appeal but has a kind of a subtle off-white kind of quality to it french vanilla (laughs) that's pretty pretentious but that's true let's here we are i also find working on light colors um it's just fun. It's bright. It creates like a bright space. I'm not always in a good mood when I draw, to be honest with you. Like I, I often will be a little bit grumpy. <laughs> I find that I, since I, I, I have worked uh, lately uh, by choice and because I love it in sort of uh, bright and colorful cartoons, um, I find that I, I, I need to balance that out. So I'll often like listen to or read or, you know, be watching in the background like really grim documentaries and audiobooks to sort of <laughs> offset the the pleasantness and and by turn like I, I I love my art space and the work I'm creating to be pleasant and 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 comforting uh whenever it can be so it they kind of complement each other I'm actually gonna fill all that in um, so I, I wanted to do this beforehand earlier, cause this is the most boring part of my process. Um, so I'll try and speed this up for you a little bit. This is the part that in any of my, uh, exported videos always goes by super, super fast. Um, but it actually takes hours and this is when I throw on an audio book or whatever and I just tune out. Um, am I able to live on the road because of the iPad and Berkeley? Yes, absolutely. Um, I told this story a bunch and I, I never know how often or, or who's heard it already, but, um, when I initially picked up the iPad, I was, uh, really <laughs> desperate for a mobile solution as soon as possible. And the reason for that was that I was falling in love with a woman on the internet <laughs> who was, uh, over here in, in Vancouver, which is where I am currently, um, and uh, I was over on the East Coast in the area, sort of Boston area of the States and uh, realized that I was working on my Cintiq from a desktop computer and I was kind of nailed down um, and couldn't travel with that setup. And I, I you know, I could, I could only travel when I wasn't working. Um, 
and that just wasn't viable for a long distance relationship. Uh, so I was really looking for any possible solution to something easily transportable that could do everything I needed it to, uh, and I could take it with me and, and just kind of take my work on the go. And the iPad Pro kind of dropped right around then, and I jumped on it as quickly as possible. Uh, it's like, that's that's it. Let's just do it. Um, <laughs> I'll learn. I'll figure it out. Whatever I don't know, I'll figure it out. Um, and uh, just kind of leapt, leapt in with both feet. Um, and it's been a blast uh, to learn. And, and now I'm married, <laughs> which is awesome. Um, and uh, it's pretty cheesy, but it's true. Um, so I, I, I definitely have since then been able to travel a little bit more. Um, that's always gated by like money and time and, you know, just circumstances of life in general, you know, you can't always be on the road, but, um, but I've really been glad to get to, to travel. I procreate, uh, brought me with them to Poland two years ago, I think it was. Uh, which is awesome. We had a great time over in Poland for the Promised Land Art Festival, and I was able to bring a little bit of work with me as I went. I've been up and down in Nashville, been out to Vancouver a bunch. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been pretty cool. I really like it. And I, I, I since have sort of, you know, realized that um, I'm very particular about my workspace, uh, but I don't mind working in public, but I have very specific <laughs> stipulations about where in public and what the vibe is and so i immediately make a map when i arrive in a new place of all the like a mental map of all the uh coffee shops that have comfy seats that are near <laughs> open uh charging stations and i figure that out pretty quickly you overhear the wildest things in coffee shops it's pretty funny to be a part of just kind of the endless stream of people who exist in these like in between spaces and I've, I've been privy to like the first date of two divorcees that met on the internet uh <laughs> meeting for the first time at a starbucks and a psychic consultation uh that was happening like <laughs> right next to me um that was wild that was wild. It was between these two women, this one woman with bright pink hair and this older Italian woman um, who was telling her everything about her husband and their marriage and their difficulties. And then her husband showed up and he didn't know that she was getting like her, her car or her psychology. I don't, I don't even know what it was. There was, there was talk of goddesses and things of that nature. Her husband shows up. What are you doing here, honey? That was so good. <laughs> So that's what the, the iPad has enabled me to eavesdrop on. <laughs> Strangers. But it's good fun. You meet fun people and some weirdos and, you know, good stories. Oh, okay, let's see what we can do. about this how's this right now can you hear me talking still i know the tapping is is going on sorry my headphones cut out um procreate will let me know if the stream is doing all right it's still live and is the sound coming through
maybe can you <laughs> hear me? I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> testing, testing, testing. Taps, just taps. Perhaps you should be able to hear me. That's very strange. The taps are much louder, yeah. Yeah, sorry about this. I'll try and talk really loudly. <laughs> My headphones are charging back up. Of course, we couldn't have this without further technical difficulties. So, just have to do our best with what we have. Just gonna try and get through this phase of the drawing. This part is uh, just a part of the process that I used to spend this time and attention with inking, and sometimes I still do. Um, but I used to do a lot more sort of uh, polished line art driven pieces. Um, and I, for various reasons, just of interest and, and sort of stylistic stuff that was just kind of pulling me in a different direction, I decided to, to try work with fewer sort of hard lines. It's also a bit easier on my hand. Um, I don't know how many of you are uh, big into like sort of comic style inking and doing really uh, detailed line art, but sometimes that can get a little bit hard on the old wrist. Um, and I was finding that I, I wanted to, to take a break and try something new. So I've been working uh, linelessly for a while now. Um, and that has been uh, very educational for me, actually. I've, I've learned a lot um, about my process and about the way I think by moving away from line. Um, it's just a personal choice, really, is, is all there is to it. Nothing's better or worse, really, about it. but. Um, but I've definitely found that my wrists are happier for it. And I now devote the time that I normally would put into getting really crisp, specific inks into this phase of the drawing where I'm getting the silhouettes worked out very precisely. How are we doing? Can you hear me? And is this better? So sorry about that. Maybe we'll do this again sometime and there'll be fewer technical difficulties. I would be so happy. But I'm waiting for confirmation that you can hear my voice and less tapping. Yay! Sounds like we're good. Sorry, everyone. I know the tapping can be so obnoxious. It's a really funny fact of it is that like when, when the headphones aren't working or if I don't have them around or whatever, if I'm ever trying to stream from the iPad, that all you can hear is the, the pencil just slamming back up and down on the screen. Um, which just, of course, that would be, <laughs> that would be the most of the audio. Cause it's just, oh, a bonds. It's all one thing. There's no like separate tablet that I'm using. It's just the exact location of the microphone is the thing I'm hitting repeatedly with the stylus. So I was just talking, I think you probably heard about the blocking in process and how that's replaced kind of the inking process for me. Um, 
can be really cathartic and it just, it sets things up, you know? I, I, the early part of the process is thrilling, but it's also kind of sometimes stressful. You're thinking about, okay, all right, all right, what, what does the character look like? And what are the props? And what are all the different aspects of the design that I have to get in here? Um, and then at this point, I can just begin to think more purely about color and shape and less about sort of the, the details of a given design, which again, that is the, the, the best part, the most fun part is figuring out all those details, but, um, but working through color and shape and just finessing, you know, getting into the details like this, it, it's pleasant. I like it. It's kind of zen. Let's me relax. Sometimes I'll get into a situation where I'm caught between the two phases or I, I can't sort of burrow down into my weird Zen blocking in space for whatever reason, because the project like won't let me or ex extended sketching and stuff like that going back and forth. And that could be for whatever reason that always really kind of stresses me out. So I just want to move forward into, into getting things done, making them look pretty. Uh, the tricky thing is I want to like move on with this so that you guys can see the fun parts, but I also get really attached to like, oh, but I want, I want to get her foot. I like this foot. <laughs> so bear with me one second here. I promise once I do the foot, we'll just move on and I'll come back for the rest later. So you just have to imagine that I spent the hour or two that it would take, probably not an hour or two, but, uh, you know, yeah, well, actually, honestly, all things considered, probably about that much time to get the full thing blocked in properly. Um, you know what? Her glasses are just a part of her, her silhouette, so we'll keep those in. Sometimes I have to think in advance a little more strategically about how I want to build this character um, in this stage where I'm thinking about, okay, do I want the glasses blocked in on a separate layer so that I can manipulate them individually? Um, ultimately, all the different colors of her all want to have on individual layers so that I can adjust them and make sure they're all working harmoniously. Um, As I do this, now is a fine time for any questions you guys have about the process or about dragons, freelancing, coffee shops. <laughs> Anything at all, let me know. Okay, I'm just, I gotta resist the impulse to get too detailed here. Okay, so what we basically have now is like a, a pretty crisp layer with a silhouette on it. Uh, but the internal details, there's nothing there yet. Um, got a couple of empty layers. So what I do personally, I know there are probably better ways to do this. Um, I use that layer as a mask and I create masked layers um, to create the next set of like local colors. Um, and what are those you may ask? And I will show you right now. Do I have a rule of thumb for making the silhouettes and how long do I give myself to finish a character? Both good questions. Um, I have a rule of thumb, the silhouettes. I think for silhouettes, I mean, you know, by and large, when I'm doing a design and creating a character, you want to be able to see as much as possible uh, of, of their design and of what, what's going on um, at all times. So what that means is that, you know, the instead of layering things on top of each other, kind of the way that it gets busy right in here with the hands layering on top of her torso, uh, on top of the teacup, uh, more like the tail and the wings spread out where um, the layering uh, is spread out. So you're seeing everything and the silhouette is showing you a little bit more information uh, all on its own. Not sure if that makes as much sense as I hope it does, but 
definitely better to open up the silhouette and show everyone the design um, because that's the function of it, right? Usually when I'm, I'm working on a contract, the function isn't to create um, a really complex and difficult to decipher, but interesting to look at pose, you know? Uh, although that can be fun and sometimes, you know, I, I get chances to do that and, and I'll do that for, for on my own just for fun. Um, it can be, uh, quite a puzzle for, you know, any, uh, other colleagues of mine to like un unravel later and I have to explain a lot and try and help them understand what it is that I've designed. So right now I'm just starting to lay in like the basic fluctuations in the blue in her skin. I like to have like a, a basic set of colors to play with and base it on, you know, I, I'm going to add colors like her underbelly and her shawl and stuff like that. But I want to have a skin tone of blue and of the sort of cluster of blues that I know that I like. And then I can sort of adjust those other colors based on what I decide this blue is going to look like. How, and uh, the question about how long? Um, keep it lighter. There, there we go. So that's where I want it. This kind of light, slightly desaturated blue. Sorry. How long do I give myself to finish a character? Uh, <laughs> give myself is such a, a, a delightful, colorful idea. Uh, I don't give myself any time ever. I'm given. <laughs> uh, uh, I usually have, it depends on what we negotiate, you know, what, what the you know, contract is. And I could scale my efforts um, to adjust to whatever it is that the client needs. Um, but generally speaking, for the work that I'm proud of, that uh, I like to put out there, I need a solid day, um, sometimes you know two, to do the work uh, of a, a single character design to its like best state. Um, that'd be two days, I'd say. And that is just pure art making time, and that does not actually reflect what the the process actually usually takes because I'm going back and forth with a company and all the different stakeholders and people who care and, and they're looking at the design oh you know a little bit less this and oh, we don't really like the blue and um things change pretty drastically uh, as the process goes on um so I use the smudge tool a little bit to kind of blend her underbelly color with the blue a little bit and I find that the I love the way that like cream and blue interact. I think it's really lovely. Look at all those, those lovely tones. Some of my favorite colors are between those two right there. And you can see what I mean about once I got the blue down, now I know what kind of cream I want to use. Whereas before, I wasn't sure yet. So time, time about, about a day or two uh, of pure work. Um, characters generally to like land a design. Uh, three days is a would be a great tight nailing it schedule. Um, usually it takes about a week. And I'm working on other characters at the same time and stuff like that. So it's not like, you know, not usually that it's a whole week on one character. Um, but often enough, pretty often. Especially when you think that the character is really important, right? So say you're designing a character for, I don't know, I haven't worked on Overwatch, but Overwatch, you know, or it's Spyro himself. Spyro himself, you know, I helped to redesign him and that took at least a week, you know, several revisions and passes might have wound up being more like two weeks. And then, then you're expanding on it, you're trying out new poses and you're doing expression sheets. And I really love expression sheets, as it turns out. Um, I've really gotten into those lately. Um, so it can, it can really expand depending on what the, what the needs are of the project. Other questions? Someone asks, at this point in my career, do I still feel a need to search around for jobs or do they usually find you? I imagine freelancing must be hard to break into, but then it becomes sustainable. Um, 
And then the other question was, how do I determine my color palette? And since we're working in color right now, I'm going to answer that one first, and then we'll come back to the freelance question. Color palette wise, um, it's so subjective. You know, color is such a an ephemeral, weird thing. Um, people have such personal preferences about color. Um, and I just, I'm the same way, you know, I, I draw from obscure personal sources. Like I mentioned the frozen yogurt shop, jelly bots reference earlier that like, you know, certain weird combinations of colors and tones will get into my head. And then that'll just become kind of a look I chase for a while. Um, and that, you know, can definitely be the case here. So, but I usually, as I, as I uh, create color palettes, I build. So just like I'm doing with this one, and I, I definitely recommend it, I start with a with a blue, uh, and I know that I like the blue that I'm using, you know, and I, I get that blue first of all foremost to a point where I'm confident that it's it's a good blue for her, and then every other color can sort of be adjusted and lightened or darkened or saturated or desaturated depending on how it interacts with that blue as I go. Um, so I think deciding on like a base color. Uh, figuring out like what color one is then really helps determine what colors you know two three four and five are um, and then just kind of harmonize around that first color and sometimes what I'm doing here you know like I'll uh, if I take this this horn and then I smudge it I wouldn't because horns don't really s sort of blend into the skin like that um, but I'll I'll go in and I'll color sample from the smudge area to get some of those intermediate tones um, for different parts of the design uh it's kind of a nice little trick um to sort of smudge two colors together and then sample from the from the smudge area that you've just created to get new colors from that uh the freelance question about sustainable freelance uh you know is it am i at a point where it's uh more sustainable yes i am definitely at a point where contract stuff is more steady um it did really start out rocky uh, and so I'm very grateful to be in a place where um, things are working out better. Um, that is by no means mean that I don't need to hustle for the work and, and, and go out and consistently kind of talk to people and uh, put my portfolio around and send emails out and get feelers going and stuff like that. I don't think maybe there will be a time when I, I won't ever have to do that, but um, and for the most part, you know, contracts roll in um, and, and, you know, I talk through it and sort of figure out what, what to do, um, what the next best move is. Um, and that's, you know, that's been the pattern lately and I'm really grateful for it. Um, but that's not always the case and there are always going to be seasons of, of plenty and seasons of, of less. So it's good to have stuff to fall back on or personal project stuff to start to, to develop when uh, things aren't coming in. Um, so the beginning of freelance is the hardest part. It really, it, it's, it was so difficult um, to get started. Okay, here's another uh, color palette trick here I'm gonna show you. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll keep skipping back to the freelance question because there's so much there. Um, And actually, uh, it's going to be a big month. I just um, I just spoke with Bobby Chu uh, for his Schoolism uh, interview series. And I talk a lot about some of the freelance uh, questions that you guys are raising uh, with him. So when that, that goes live, okay, keep an eye out for the conversation with Bobby Chu because there's a lot of kind of freelance experience conversation in that. Um, uh, this color palette. So I have no intention of using this purple that I've currently put down. I just picked one in kind of the general zone. That's so intense. That's not what I want. I want something much more like like this, you know, very faint kind of mask. I don't know what it is, eyeshadow kind of look. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, I'm just laying it in really dark and then walking it back. Uh, it's just that again, it's going to be really subtle. And actually, I'm going to bring it all the way back to 
and then walk it back down, and then to create kind of an opalescent sheen, brush in a little bit of the more highly saturated version of it. So you see how that works? It's just a little bit of textured saturated version of the same color over a desaturated one that's blended in with the base. And now you've got kind of a kind of a shine, you know, like some makeup kind of reflects. Do uh, a freelancing question. Do I, ha I think it's necessary to have studio experience before going freelance? Um, I, that's a good question. I had studio experience before going freelance and I thought it was really useful and, and valuable. Uh, by no means do I think that it's absolutely necessary. Um, everybody has such different paths and the longer you do this, the more you realize that there are no universal experiences in art and art making. Um, but uh, there are definitely some best practices. And I, I think that it can really help to have some understanding of how a studio works. Because as a freelancer, you're, at least the way I, I work, and I work for studios doing contracts. So I've, I've you know, worked with DreamWorks TV and with Disney Publishing and with um, Guerrilla Games and with Activision and, and, and Toys for Bob on, on Spyro and with EA Games and with uh, Riot and with all these different companies. Um, and I, I, you know, my process is my own and I'm home and I'm sort of, you know, coffee shops or whatever the contract allows. And, um, and that's all well and good, but it can really help uh, to, to have a, at least some sense of what the environment in studio is like. Uh, as you're doing that, you know, just to sort of know what the process is like, who else is working with the assets you're handing off. Um, I think it can be uh, certainly a huge help um, to a freelancer to know going in uh, what, what the landscape is, you know. New question. How often do I work in studio versus from home? Uh, I, I, I don't work at, in studio uh, at all these days, really. Um, I work from home all the time. Um, I have done some extended uh, studio stints uh, and, and really enjoyed that and gotten a lot out of it. Um, uh, these days, it's mostly in studio work. Oh, sorry. <laughs> wow. My brain just sometimes when I'm doing this, it just turns off, huh? Uh, let's select that. There we go. Mask that. I'm going to do the glasses. Uh, kind of a pale pink, I think. Yep. That'll do. Although I want slightly less saturation. these. All right, you see I'm just adjusting colors based on other colors. Um, sometimes with contracts uh, to, to the studio question, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, have an opportunity to fly out, go check out the studio for a day or a couple of days, and then, um, and then come back. Uh, and that's, that's great. I love, you know, getting to be able to do that uh, on the occasion that, you know, uh, it's affordable and, and possible to do because then I, I get to meet the team and get a much stronger sense of who I'm working with. Uh, and that can be enormously valuable. But um, again, lately, the end result of that is that I wind up coming home and, and, and interacting with them on Slack or Skype or whatever works best for everyone. My last and longest in-studio gig was with Hasbro, uh, where I worked. I was working on the Play-Doh team, um, <laughs> and literally, you know, I, I uh, they needed me in-house, and that was close to where I was living at the time. Um, and I could just sit on the floor and play with Play-Doh all day, and make sculptures and create character designs like literally out of Play-Doh, and that was that was good fun. Another question here. 
If you find that a strong social media presence is crucial for freelancing or has your published final work spoken for you, I, I would always recommend a strong social media presence um, for sure for freelancers. Um, I have no definite way of quantifying you know, uh, how much that versus my published work has sort of driven things. Um, but a lot of work that you do, you know, um, the publishing, like the, the, it is via social media, you know, like the, the work that you guys have probably seen of me is work that, um, you've seen because I posted it on social media. Um, and the, that, that is the act of publishing now, you know, especially for concept artists whose work, you know, you'd never see it if it wasn't posted in their, you know, at least their portfolio, but certainly on ArtStation or on Tumblr or on Instagram or you know, wherever you're seeing it, because the work is not in the final game. The, the, it, it's buried. It's, it's underneath all the characters and the designs uh, are these drawings, but you're not necessarily seeing those. Um, Actually, in Spyro, it's a, there's an unlockable concept art gallery, which is good fun. Um, so you can actually see some of the drawings I did and the team, which was an awesome team. We had a great team of people working together on that project. Um, hold on a moment. Let's just get these glasses in a good place. Sometimes you got to go upside down, you know? This is what I talk about when I say this, this, this part of the process can go on for hours and you, know, you just, you just want to finesse it. You want to get all the details in and you want to make sure that the foundation is there. So then when I go in for the slightly more fun parts later, um, That they're all there. Sorry, I just cut out because I'm just thinking about color. That's better. Uh, good advice someone gave you with art that you think of and use all the time. Mm. There's a lot of it. There certainly is a lot of good advice out there and stuff that I think about often. I'm trying to think of what what's come up recently. Um, there's a lot, sundry, you know, a whole lot of, of little technical things that come up often. Um, I've talked a, a little bit recently uh, in other spaces about um, certain people in my life who gave me permission to just love what I love, um, to be really excited about. Disney movies or video games or, you know, um, it's not a specific bit of advice per se, but it's stuck with me forever. Just the idea of like, you know what, if, if you love it, like just, that's okay. You know, just love it. Just, just own that and don't apologize for it, you know, and, and to be allowed to believe that the things that we do as concept artists and artists can be independently meaningful. Um, but I see a lot um, to sort of also counterpoint that. You know, I, I see a lot of examples in various entertainment industries of people being taken advantage of. And if there's no one single nugget of advice I can bring to mind immediately, but there's a lot of conversation out there uh, among people, especially freelancers, about ways that you should be paying attention and just you know protecting yourself and, and, and keeping your eye on how you're managing your contracts with your clients and um, being sure that you're excited and in touch with your your work and what makes you want to draw, but not in a way that uh, sets you up to be taken advantage of by uh, sort of just the corporate art entertainment system. Because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a job, it's an industry, you know, and the things that we do are beautiful and I think they have worth that is beyond just their industrial use. Um, so I think that I, I've just been reading a lot about you know uh, people thinking 
in new ways about the work that they do, about the moments of self-care, you know, just taking time for yourself, advocating for yourself in the workspace and making sure that, uh, you know, we're constantly helping each other combat that culture of overwork because there's so much of a, oh no, we're back online. Let me just check. Hold on now. Up on MC and YouTube. Okay, we're back. Okay, good. Um, Because we're just about to get into the fun part. Um, Sorry about all the technical difficulties. Uh, If we ever do this again, we will have a whole different setup and it'll be great. We'll figure all this silliness out. Um, So I'm just making little minute adjustments. We're going to focus on it just kind of her head and face since that's all we have time for. Um, just, uh, imagine that I'm doing this for every other part of the design. I'm getting sucked in again. Wait, well, I'm seeing that maybe we want a little bit of shawl. Let me just block in a little bit of shawl area here just so that we can see what's going on more clearly. Um, take a very light, yeah, something in that zone. Again, I'm using Max's shader pastel to block things in. Just want to like have the visual shape of her shawl to work with as we move forward, so that it's a little more clear what's what. Um, So what I'm going to do next is the shadows, and that's where I, I have a lot of fun. Um, the sketching is really fun. The blocking is very zen, you know, very much. I'm just kind of in my my head, and I can talk a little bit more and stuff. And then the, the time comes for us to do the shading, and I like that time. Uh, to start, do a couple things start to because i'm going to be adding like darkness darkness um <laughs> to the piece uh i start by brightening up some areas so that can look like uh a slight overlay layer oh that's kind of fun actually i like what they did to this you know it's desaturated i kind of like her nose being a little pinker we can try it both ways um, do, 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 do. So just like brightening up the the base layers with a little bit of sort of extra light. All right, and then. Again, using this same mask, so using the silhouette as a guide. Set this to multiply. And then find the right color to work with. There we go. That'll totally do. What's this dragon's name? I did ask when we started, although <laughs> it's been a while. And also the stream has had some problems, but um, if you guys have any thoughts about the name, I would be very glad to hear them. She likes tea. She's she's an old biddy. She's extremely kind. And maybe sets things on fire a little more often than she'd like to admit. She likes to come off as poised, I think, but ultimately she still eats her sheep one leg at a time, just like everybody else. So if you have dragon name ideas, throw them in the chat. We will collect them. (laughs) 
I have a suspicion that my sound is once again cut out. Is that an accurate suspicion? Agatha. I love that, actually. Tilly. Tilly is great. Lillian. <laughs> These are excellent. Griselda, Priscilla, yes, yes, good, good, good. Currently, something about Agatha is really working for me, I admit. Uh, I hope that didn't just knock the streaming off. Seems like every time my battery is alerting me that it's low. One way or another, Sylvia Wanda. So we're into the shading, which is so much fun for me. I'm going to go silent here for a bit because it kind of takes my full attention to like get this bit done right. We back. Okay. Hopefully you can hear my voice. I sorry that headphones again are a little bit need another charge. <laughs> it's kind of fun wild west feeling of will it freeze? Will it work? Who knows? But we draw. We're just here drawing. I love kind of bulgy eye sockets. They're just my favorite. As often as I can, because I just love drawing them so much. I like, also just really love drawing wrinkly old characters, because it's just it's so much fun geometry to work with. sort of an idea of how this stuff all comes together. This goes. So far Agatha is still my my personal favorite for it. There's something just nice and sort of simple and pleasant about that name.
sometimes you just do something and you're like, nope, don't care for that. And that's one of those right there. Definitely the way this is changing her face. Agatha Crispy is the winner. Absolutely. Agatha Crispy is so good. Oh my gosh. I was actually, I didn't even say it, but I was thinking, like, is there a way we can work a good old fashioned dragon pun into this name? Agatha Crispy. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. That's stupid. <laughs> oh, boy. That's so dumb. I love it. <laughs> Makes me feel like she needs... I don't know. I think we can just name her Agatha without needing to actually make any. Or Agatha Crispy with it. Or needing to be a, a novelist of anything. I think that as I get older, <laughs> the dad puns are just, they're just coming for me. And it's, it's inevitable. And I just can't help. I think is funny. Uh, I'm doomed. It's only my endless tide of stupid meme posts that are keeping me from the edge of the little dad them and even then. So really, like, this part of the process is where a lot of the shape and kind of, I don't know, I think of it as pretty magical. I really like discovering volumes like this, if it makes any sense. Because it's, it's fun, it's like, it's like an unwrapping process for me as well. Like, I'm used to, or have a, a long history in, like, very sort of comic booky. Uh, animation e to the work and to get to sort of work through this lighting and volume phase that is uh, I, it, it, there's a temptation to overwork it to get really stuck into all the details and get everything really shiny and slick and cool and, that, and that's great a lot of people do that great I am not that artist but I really still love um, I really still love the feeling of volume you know I just love like getting sense of the the full roundness or whatever shape it, it happens to be of any given form um and that's been a unfolding thing for me I, I haven't always like loved that or understood how to make that work for me but recently volume has been a big fixation I keep wanting to add more dimension to her nose. There we go, that's better. I'm on the top of her. Sorry about the quietness. I think I might be able to put my headphones back in. Hopefully that stream won't cut out on us the moment I do. Let's find out. Who knows? Thank <laughs> you. 